everyone, will everyone please join me in Gasho and recite the Nembutsu with me. Namo Amida Butsu. 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 Good morning, everyone. I don't recognize some of the people in our Sangha today. It seems that we are celebrating Halloween. How wonderful. So, but how, how many of you Dharma school students got a head start on eating candy? Okay, all right. That's, one person was honest. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, we're going to continue our discussion today on Sila. So, we remember the first of the six paramitas is dana, right? What does dana mean? I heard that from the back. Very good. Selfless giving. Selfless giving. That means giving without expecting anything in return, which is actually a lot harder to do than we think. So, uh, but today we're going to be talking and continuing our talk about sila. One of these, one of the ways that this could be understood is not engaging in uh, harmful behavior or non-harmful behavior or ethical conduct. Let's be honest, sila is probably the hardest paramita to follow. We don't always know what the right thing to do is. Sometimes it feels like we can do nothing right. No matter how much we do, it never seems to be enough. And our selfish thoughts can be a, the largest barrier to ethical conduct or to behaving in a, um, a non-harmful way. You know, we have these questions in our minds sometimes where we have, uh, where we think to ourselves, why should I have to, you know, why should it have to be me? You know, everyone else behaves badly. Why do I need to behave? Everyone else doesn't seem to have the same responsibility. It's unfair. I think all of us have had these thoughts every now and then, like, why does it have to be me? Or why am I the one who has to behave in a, in a good way? But then we have to ask ourselves this question. Why is being mean and exclusive easy, um, but being kind is hard? Kindness and inclusiveness requires us to temporarily think outside of ourselves. This is why. Being mean and exclusive can, or even cruel only shows a narrow scope of people who agree with us. Cruelty and anger requires no hard work. It's easy. And at the same time, we all have the potential for great kindness as well. It requires us, uh, it requires us though, to be patient, understanding, and loving. Some easy questions though, what does the Buddha tell us about all of this? Anger leads to more anger. Violence begets more violence. Karma is cause and effect, not divine punishment. Part of the Buddhist path is causing as little harm as possible. I'd like to stop and look at these, um, look at these uh, bullet points that the Buddha has taught us and things to be very mindful of. You know, when we do something that we know probably isn't the best thing or, you know, we didn't handle in the best way, you know, we realize this, I think, that we, we realize this in ourselves and we want to question ourselves and ask ourselves, what could I have done better? And then I sometimes remember hearing back in my old high school days, people talking about the concept of karma. Dharma school students, show of hands, who has heard this word before, karma? Now question, how many of you have used it like saying, ah, karma's gonna get you, <laughs> right? Like as if karma is going to be as some type of like a uh, monster, right? That comes, you know, to get you. That's actually not what karma is. Karma literally means cause and effect, but it means also that our actions, the things that we choose to do will have an effect on not just me, not just maybe the other person, but a whole ripple effect. I think I like this. Um, I actually really like this, uh, uh, the way that this, the, the, um, the hondo is set up here, because when we think about karma, right, the actions that the people in the first two rows 
could actually have an effect on the people in the very back rows as well. You know, when you look and see how much we are interlinked, how far our effect can go, right? That is the idea of karma. So when we make a decision or when we do an action that we know to necessarily be probably not the best thing, we have to ask ourselves, how is this going to affect not just me or the other person, but the future, right? The, you know, how is this going to go down, you know, go down the line? Now, all of this seems obvious, doesn't it? You know, if I say we should practice kindness, if I say, think of interconnectedness or interdependence or togetherness or oneness, all of this seems easy or it seems for me to easy for me to say it's easy for me to say you know be kind to other people be gentle to other people right we, we it's been a while since we since we have recited the golden chain but you know part of that part of the lines in in the golden chain is i will be kind and gentle to every living thing and protect all who are weaker than myself but the question is is how much do we take that to heart you know, it all seems very obvious when I say, you know, when we, when I, not just for me, you know, not just to you all, but for myself, right, be kind to other people. And why do we as people mess up a lot of the times? Why do we make these mistakes? I think we need to always ask ourselves, especially when we get into arguments or disagreements, if we could have handled the situation differently. And that really begs the question, is being kind so hard? Sometimes we don't receive kindness. We receive, you know, we receive, uh, you know, someone being mean to us. We receive an injustice towards us. And sometimes it's easy for us to turn that, you know, to turn that sense of hurt into anger and then give that to somebody else. But here are some real life examples of non-ethical behavior. And this is something I definitely want the Dharma school students to listen to, but as well as the adults. But in school, I think the, these things are easy to, you know, this is very easy to happen. So pay attention, Dharma school students, some real life examples of non-ethical behavior. Okay, so look carefully. And if, and if you have your smartphones with you, feel free to take a picture of this as well. <laughs> but some real life examples of non-ethical behavior are things that I hope, and I'm certain you don't, but I hope you don't do. You exclude others, telling someone to just go away for no good reason, just because you don't want to be bothered by them. Joining in a crowd who is making fun of someone, whether they are there or not. It's easy to gossip and talk about people behind their backs, but also, you know, I've, you know it's possible to see cruelty on the schoolyard as well. Making fun of someone based on race, gender identity, sexual orientation, cultural practices, economic status, disabilities, religion, and the list goes on. Any type of discriminatory behavior is non-ethical and should not be done. Lying about knowledge or about, or about credentials, right? We like to sometimes make up stories about ourselves or possibly elevate ourselves to a degree. However, the more we try to boost ourselves up and the more we try to take credit for something that we did not do, the, the easier it will be for that lie to blow up in our face. So with this in mind, this type of, you know, this type of uh, uh, paramita, sila, is really there for us to realize you know, how we should try to be in, in all of our communities kind, gentle, welcoming, accepting. Is it that hard? It can be sometimes, especially when we're having a bad day. But I think in the long run, it's never hard to be kind to a person, to make a person feel included. And especially with, you know, new, with newer people here at uh, Dharma School, I want all of the senior Dharma School students to do their best to make sure that the younger Dharma school students or the newer Dharma school students feel included in the activities today. This isn't to say that I don't think that you already do that, but I want to say for the sake of inclusivity and for the sense of community. Lastly, Dharma school students, um, and especially I, this probably is more directed to the Dharma school students because I'm not sure how much time 
our, um, our, our, our older uh, members spend on the internet. But I want us to be careful about something called call out culture. We sometimes call it cancel culture, but you know, um, I, and I have a bit of a context to this, but our kids and our youth are on the internet so much these days. You watch TikTok, you watch YouTube shorts, you watch Instagram videos a lot, and you are exposed to a lot. So I want to actually talk a little bit about this before I end my Dharma talk today. First things first, Dharma school students, remember this, the internet is forever. So I remember, you know, again, I realize that, you know, in, this, in, in the message of Buddhism, right, we talk about impermanence and things are always changing. However, the internet is forever is a statement that we should always be listening to. What you post online, like in terms of like things that you say or the things that you share, right? Like if you're sharing your opinion about something, right? And you post it publicly for all people to see, remember that it is out there forever. Now, here's something I always also want to make absolutely clear. Calling out bad and toxic behavior should definitely be done, right? So if there is like a celebrity or another famous person or a person of influence who is engaging in bad behavior, it should be put to light and it should be called out and it should be uh, stopped, absolutely. But before you do, before we call out people or before we totally you know, put our, our own selves out there, we must ask ourselves first, am I guilty of the same thing? How am I going to structure my argument? Am I really an expert on this matter? How can I present this without alienating the people I am trying to reach? So these are very important things that we have to think about. This isn't to say that I don't want you to uh, engage in social justice or to, um, you know, especially to call out, uh, you know, harmful and toxic and bad uh, policies or, or societal norms that, you know, definitely uh, hurt people. That for sure, I want you to be a part of the movement to stop that. But I also think that Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, our sect of Buddhism, requires us, all of us, to constantly continue to um, self-check ourselves as well. Are we so innocent of the things that we accuse other people of? Are we so pure and above board and you know, above, you know, above it all? And the minute we become very you know, too confident in our opinions or too confident in that we're right, then I think is, that's a very clear indication that all of us need to check ourselves. So with this in mind, Dharma School students, this is the second talk on the concept of sila, which, mean, which means ethical conduct, okay, ethics or in some sense, morality. Buddhism has a very, very interesting relationship with this concept. But what I love about it is that remember the two eyes of Buddhism, impermanence, but the most second, and the most second important, the, the, the most important one in this conversation, interdependence. This is why sila is so important for that concept. All of us are interconnected with each other. The connect, you know, the actions that we do will have an effect on everyone around us. So with this in mind, Dharma School students, let's close with Gosh Shol. And repeat the Nambutsu with me. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namandats, 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 Namandats. Will everyone please join me in Gasho as I read the words of our founder, Master Shinran Shonin. I am in reality a foolish being of birth and death, possessed of deep and heavy karmic evil and transmigrating in the six courses. The suffering is beyond words. Now encountering a true teacher, I have been able to hear the name that embodies Amida's primal vow. The Buddha instructs me to say the Nembutsu single-heartedly and aspire for birth. May the Buddha's compassion, never abandoning the universal primal vow, grasp me, a disciple. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namas, namandats, namandats.
Good morning again, everyone. I'm wondering if we should um, have Halloween for the kids every weekend, because, man, I've seen, this is the most kids I've seen at Tacoma Buddhist Temple. It's like, if we had Halloween every weekend, we'd have, our, our, our Honda would be full. So I'd actually like to talk to the adults today about the concept of sila, or ethics. When it comes to sila or ethics, it's easy to teach ethics and morality to children, isn't it? You know, share, uh, you know, uh, don't talk back to your parents, respect your teachers, respect your elders. But yet when we become adults, seem things, you know, sometimes it, things seem to become more complicated. I think as adults, we sometimes tend to ask ourselves, maybe not all the time, but sometimes, am I a good person? Parents hope to be good examples for their children. Teachers hope to be good role models for their students. Supervisors and heads of state even hope to inspire the good in, in, um, the good in humanity or in society, hopefully. And clergy or ministers, we hope to assist in the awakening of spiritual inspiration. But as, a, but as a person in society, I think most of us just hope that we're doing a decent job of either making the world a better place or making our community a better place or just improving ourselves in general. When we think about Shinran Shonin and we do some readings of Shinran Shonin, one of the things that comes out is his sincere look at himself his sincere look at his own human nature or the human condition. You'll hear Shinran in his Kyogyo Shinsho and in a lot of his writings talk about what a foolish being he is. And of course, this isn't, this isn't to say that Shinran wasn't smart, right? When I talk about foolish beings, I'm talking about a person who is also afflicted with the normal everyday things that we are afflicted with mainly the three poisons, our greed, anger, and ignorance. We want things a certain way. We want things to be a certain way. We want people to be a certain way. And when we don't get that way, we become angry. And that's because we fail to realize or we are, are imbued in our own ignorance or our own foolishness. So because of this particular viewpoint, Shinran does talk a little bit about the nature of good versus evil or this type of you know, morality complex. And he says this in the Tani Show. I know the text is a little small, so I will read. This is from the Tani Show, which is a uh, document that I think is very important to the Jodo Shinshu uh, world. Um, I don't normally use it all that much, but for the sake of today's Dharma talk, I will read the portion of it. So according to the person who wrote the Tani Show, some say Yu Yenbo, one of Shinran's students, I know nothing at all of good or evil. For if I could know thoroughly, as Amida Tathagata knows, that an act was good, then I would know good. If I could know thoroughly, as the Tathagata knows, that an act was evil, then I would know evil. But when a foolish being full of blind passions or full of afflictions, I gotta stop using that word blind passions, uh, afflictions, in this fleeting world, this burning house, all matters without exception are empty and false, totally without truth and sincerity. The Nembutsu alone is true and real. What he's talking about here is the sort of fundamental nature of, of, our, of ourselves as humans or as actions that we, or the actions that we do. Some people have asked Shinran, is doing this a good thing or a bad thing? And Shinran would respond with an answer like this, according to Yuyan. But what does Shinran Shonin actually mean here? So again, the problem with the Tani Show or the problem with reading deep religious documents like this is that it can sometimes lead people on a perilous journey to either nihilism or uh, basically saying, oh, nothing matters, I can do whatever I want, or total hedonism, I guess you could say, and basically indulging in all the impulses that we may have. But however, Shinran is taking, I think, a deeper look at to the truthfulness of, of ourselves as people. 
Can we honestly say that we are 100% without ego or fault? Are we too confident in our views of the world and what we think truth is? Most importantly, humans are complicated. I'm, you know, again, we're not talking about, you know, are we necessarily like, you know, hurtful or harmful people, but we are people filled with ego, filled with the sense of self. And for Shinran's credit, while we are honest about ourselves of who we are, we are beings who are not enlightened yet, which means that we are filled with ego, or we are filled with greed, anger, and ignorance. This doesn't mean that we just give up and don't do anything to help society or the world. Uh, uh, from the practice, I'm sorry, from uh, Shinran Chonin's practice of the Kyogyo Shinsho, the Buddha's desire to bring all foolish beings, whether good or evil, to turn about at heart, express this, uh, express this in deep practice, and so attain birth. This is the witness to birth through, through, uh, through the Nembutsu, a manifestation of the decisive cause of birth in the Pure Land. One of the things I wanted to mention here from this particular um, part of the text is to turn about at heart. Shinran talks about this as well in his letters to his, to his Sangha members. Because of documents or because they may have heard Shinran say something similar to what he said in the Tani Show, some people have gravely misunderstood what Shinran Shonin was saying and during his time took part in actions called Zōaku Muge or licensed evil, which means that they committed crimes, they committed harm, they did very bad things because they misunderstood or they thought that, oh, by doing these bad things, we are proving our, our non-practice or our non-self-power like you know self -power to get into the Pure Land. But this itself is also self-power. Shinran Shonin chastised many of his followers in his letters, saying that you should not indulge in, you know, in violent or harmful actions. Most importantly, from one of his letters, he said that for the Nembutsu is like medicine, right? You know, Nembutsu is the, you know, taking a part in the Dharma. So the Nembutsu is like medicine. So just because you have an antidote or medicine, does that mean you continue to drink the poison? No, of course not. So this is why, once again, in terms of our Dharma talks or in terms of, you know, our teachings, why it's important to keep looking towards Amida Buddha. Not literally the statue, of course, if that helps you, then that's wonderful. But, you know, why we should continue to focus our thoughts on Amida Buddha. If we can continue to hear the message of wisdom and compassion being freely given to us, then we can continue to strive to live, the, uh, live our lives, um, to live as best as we can. And we, of course, we might fail from time to time. We are human after all. But the one thing that Jodo Shinchu does not do is that it doesn't use our humanness as an excuse to overindulge in selfish actions or, or, harmful, uh, or harmful behaviors either. So this is why I think Jodo Shinchu can be somewhat of a complicated teaching as well. When it comes to Dharma school students and children, it's easy to sort of paint the world as black and white and to say that, you know, this is good and this is bad. This is harmful, this is not. But when we become adults, we realize that the world is truly not just black and white. Life is gray and that makes life hard. Sometimes people want to go to religion to give, to give themselves clarity and to give themselves like the easy answer for things. I think this is why Jodo Shinchu sometimes is very frustrating for people, or uh, Buddhism in itself is frustrating for people, because there isn't always a clear and definite answer. Yes, there are definite things that are said in Buddhism, like to not cause harm, interconnectedness, and of course for us in Jodo Shinchu, just say the Nembutsu. But for a person living in everyday life and wanting an easy answer to what's going to solve my problems or how can I resolve this conflict, one of the things that Jodo Shinchu talks about here is to deeply introspect within oneself. So this is the last part of the Dharma talk here, but Jodo Shinchu is a path of self-reflection at all times. So not only is it just saying the Nembutsu and taking refuge in Amida Buddha, 
But first, we also have to realize why we're saying Nembutsu in the first place. We are saying Nembutsu because we are imperfect beings, because we know we are not enlightened. And this isn't a Dharma talk to bash us all or to say that we're all bad people, right? No, no, that's not how it is. Shinran first actually challenged the notions of good and bad. And I think to put it in a nutshell, people are complicated. And people have hangups, we have afflictions. But things that I think we need to remember here in terms of self reflection and in the self reflective part of our religion is if we become too confident in our righteousness, it might be an indication of our afflictions at work. And again, this is not a defense of abusive or harmful behavior. Once again, I preface this with if there is harmful or abusive behavior happening, right, to, you know, get up and stop it. Even one of my Zen friends, uh, or actually I should say Zen teachers, I'm, and not that I practice Zen, but you know, she basically said you know, about if a car passes by, just let it pass by. If you hear traffic going on outside, you know, like just sit and let it happen. If you hear an assault happening on the, you know, on the sidewalk, get up off of your cushion and go outside and help. Right, so this is it, you know, Buddhism is not a religion that just lets the world pass us by and let, and let things happen as they are. Let's continue to help people and live as mindfully as possible. But then we have to ask ourselves, are we doing it for them or are we doing it for us? Feel free to join in social justice causes and charitable activities, but always remember what the message is and that the actions don't drown out the message. So, you know, there could be a world event that causes a lot of, you know, anxiety worldwide, a global event that happens worldwide. And sometimes people really get upset, but then they do things like stand in the middle of traffic or stop air, airplanes from taking off. And again, I'm not saying that their anger is not warranted, but what if they themselves are causing harm as well for, you know, like, not just inconveniencing people, mind you, but stopping traffic could stop an ambulance from getting to the hospital just in time. These things are very important for us to ask. And again, I'm not saying that in terms of our ethical conduct or the things that we consider to be ethical, that we should not get involved in peace, you know, peace rallies or even protests, but we have to ask ourselves and remind ourselves, where is my part in this? And why am I doing this? Am I doing this to boost my own ego and to give my own sense of self-righteousness? Or am I doing this sincerely because I care for, the, uh, care for someone outside of myself? And lastly, it is always great if you can convince someone of your opinion, but then ask yourself, how much have you grown? How much have you changed your views? How much have I changed my views? It's, wonder, it's something I have to think about. I remember what my thoughts were and how I used to talk when I was in grad school, when I was at the Institute of Buddhist Studies. And I wondered to myself, how much have I changed? How much have I evolved? How, much am I, how effective am I, am I becoming? Am I still effective? These questions in terms of Jodo Shinshu are things that we need to ask ourselves and I think sometimes even wrestle with from time to time. So with this in mind, I would like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules for uh, coming to the temple today. And let's all have fun at the Halloween party and sincerely support the Dharma School children. Please join me in Gasho. I am in reality a foolish being of birth and death, possessed of deep and heavy karmic evil and transmigrating in the six courses. The suffering is beyond words. Now, encountering a true teacher, I have been able to hear the name that embodies Amida's primal vow. The Buddha instructs me to say the Nembutsu single-heartedly and aspire for birth. May the Buddha's compassion, never abandoning the universal primal vow, grasp me, a disciple. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu. Namo Amidabutsu.